Welcome back to the procedural generation mini-series. In the technique that I employed in the previous videos, I used a lot of math to determine where the next position would be. With this technique, we won't have to do any of that, and things will work a little bit more natively to how dreams works. This technique will be much easier to understand if math is not a strong suit for you and it should also be pretty simple and straightforward to put together. Procedural generation is often a very math based thing because with other game engines that are used um, with code you can use data structures to hold um, lots of information. In dreams we don't have that. We have variables but we don't have arrays or multi-dimensional arrays or any other type of complex data structure. So there has to be a better way to do procedural generation that doesn't involve math. To get started, I've just built a little platform here out of a cube. I've labeled it. Uh, well, I haven't labeled it. Let's label it something. I'll label it scenery. And it can be collidable. That's fine. This is what we're going to emit with our generation. Since this technique won't be using as much math, we will need to use something else to do the things for us. So. Let's say we have a tag somewhere, and we can name this something just as an example and name it G. And you can see this has a space or a spot in the real world. Instead of doing things in a math based way, we can use tags and teleporters to move things where we want them to go. So if I have a block here, for example, I can put a teleporter on it, and I'll place this here inside the microchip and I'll emit at G in both the orientation and the position and so when we start time we can see that it goes exactly where that ball is this little gizmo ball it should go right here one thing to note about teleporters is that they have a gizmo of their own which um, doesn't seem to align to the grid very well uh, when you first place it down um, you can see there I just moved it and aligned it to the grid so right now it's in the center of the cube and I just want to point out a little bug that hopefully gets fixed sometime soon if you move a teleporter uh, gadget even inside of a microchip if I just move it like that the gizmo seems to become misaligned you can see it's telling me to align to the grid and if I do you can see it moves very slightly so if you're using teleporters make sure that you're constantly making sure that it is um, on the grid if you're doing something grid based which we are doing so if we get out an emitter, I will set um, the speed and the um, time between emits to zero, and um, I'll leave that at infinity for now. And let's say we're going to emit this block. Now, because we're not using a scene space transform, it will emit relative to how it is when we pick it up. So if the block is here, it's going to emit there. If we move the block over here, this will carry the same type of distance and uh, direction vector to emit the new one. So for example, if I have a timer here, and when it's done, then I turn on the emitter, we can see that this block comes over here, and then it emits the object relative to how it was when we decided that's the object we wanted to emit. You can see this distance here and direction is the same as it is where we picked it up. It's just translated. So in order to fix that, we need to adjust our emitter gizmo um, relative to how we want it to emit when we teleport our other object here. So if I place it here, for example, Every time we emit something from this object, it will be exactly in this position for this emitter. So now if I start time, it teleports over and it creates the new object exactly how it was before it emitted it, or exactly how it was when we decided that was the object we wanted to emit. So it carries the same translation, that's all I'm trying to say. Since there's a limit on tags, we can't just place a tag everywhere we want um, something to be emitted. Uh, because that would be would be very limited and be very expensive and it would also be very tedious to set up 
So instead of placing tags everywhere, we're going to put tags on our object to show where the next object could be emitted at. So I'll get out a microchip here, and I'm going to group it into this object. And so now we can take a tag, and I'll just name this tag next. So this tag has a gizmo, just like the other ones. And we can place it where we want. But first, I think we should focus on where we want to place this chip. So here I've just placed the chip in the middle of the cube. It is on the surface, but it's not attached to the object. So I didn't surface snap it. And that's very important. I'll get to why that's important in a little bit. But first, we should set up our tag so that, um, I mean, we can leave it the way it is. Um, but we want to notice which way is facing outwards. Because if we're going to be emitting something here, then we need to know the exact position and set it up in a way so that this could work in multiple directions. Since I'm personally used to Z being forward or, you know, ahead, then I will place Z in the forward direction of the tag. So since we have a tag on this object, if we go back to our other object here and we use that tag, we can see what would happen if we started time. I've turned, uh, actually, let's just turn this off for a second so you can see what happens. We can see that it teleports to that object. Now, it's teleporting exactly where the gizmo is for this object to where exactly that tag was. So if we wanted this block to be flush, we can move the teleporter gizmo. And so if I move the teleporter gizmo here, this dot will go exactly where the tag dot is, or gizmo, and it will be facing, since we're matching the orientation, this chip should be on the outside facing Z. So if we start time, now we can see that it is lined up flush with this block, and the tag is facing outwards because it's matching the orientation. Since we care about our emission position without using a um, scene space transform, we have to do a little bit of manual work here in that I'll take a copy of this object and actually I'll actually just delete the microchip on this object for a second and so when we choose to emit this object we want to set it up so that the block itself is lined up appropriately since we have it so that Z is facing this way then we want to emit this thing in a way so that it will be lined up so that it can be flush with this object. So if we look at how this emitter would work, we can see that it would emit another block right here, which would be lined up with this one. So if I turn this timer back on, we can see that it will move here and then emit a new block right next to it. Now this microchip has a tag on it, and so if we copy this object directly and try to use that, we can see what happens. I'm going to set up a little cycle here. This is a way to switch back and forth between the two. And so for now, I'll use this timer. I'll set a very small target time, and I'll move this into B. Actually, I'll move it into the next. And just for demonstration purposes, I will make this one second. So we'll see that it teleports to the next tag. And then after one second, it will emit. And then after this timer is done, it should teleport to the next tag. Now the issue here is that this tag is still here. And so it doesn't know which next tag to travel to. Because we know there's one here, and we know there's one on the next object, but it's not teleporting again. This is also something to note here, which is that our chip is turned into a different direction than this one and so there's another thing that we need to fix with our emission. Now Z is in this direction as our teleporter shows and so our emitter needs to make it so that this object is how it should be when we emit it. And so since our chip is facing that direction we want it to be facing the same direction so all I did was rotate that chip, this uh, object here, the emission object, so that when it goes to emit the next one, 
it will be aligned in the proper direction. So now the tag will be here. But again, we need to figure out how we can turn this off. We can use a trigger zone and detect a scenery label, which is the label we have on our object. And we can use a cube. And I'm just going to drag this out so that it is outside of the current object and should detect the next one. This object is a 4x4, four four, so I'm going to set it to something just smaller than 4x4, four four, which would be 3.9. We just want to line this up so that it's not overlapping with our current object, which we can see, oops, which we can see based on this trigger zone gadget display here. So if it's overlapping, then we'll see that it's detecting and that's not what we want. So I'm just going to bring it out one like that. So let's say we want to have this tag on only if we're not detecting something. With this, we can uh, use the same logic. I'm just going to delete this one and make a copy of the one we just created or just edited and use that instead. And this should be still lined up. Oh, it's actually turned. Actually just going to turn this 90 degrees so that we don't have to fix the uh, orientation on the emitter every time we create a new one of these. So now if I make a copy of this and choose this to be the object we emit, we can see that it is backwards. And since we have this weird rotation problem, I'm actually going to change the teleporter gizmo here to be the other way, like so. And I'll bring this back there. And so when we choose an object to emit, we'll have to adjust this accordingly. So if that's going to be the Z direction, then we'd want it like that. So we don't have to deal with the weird rotations. So now we can see it would emit this object. And so if I start time, we can see it teleports there. And it continues to teleport to the tag in front of it because the tag that's in each chip has a trigger zone and when that's detecting something that tag turns off so there's really only one active tag at a time although there are a bunch of tags and since these are all still here there are a bunch of trigger zones so we're going to run into a thermo issue very quickly especially if we had um, a lot going on here if I make this time really fast we'll hit a trigger zone limit fairly quickly. In order to avoid hitting a limit on trigger zones and tags, we can just delete this entire chip once this trigger zone has detected something. This is why I didn't attach the microchip as a surface snap onto this cube, because we're going to be using a destroyer to get rid of this chip. If the chip was surface snapped onto the object, then when we used a destroyer, it would destroy everything including the block itself. So if I attach this destroyer to the microchip itself, then we can power it when this detects something. This destroyer will then destroy the chip, which gets rid of the trigger zone and the tag, and this should help us avoid hitting a limit on our trigger zones. So now if I start time, we can see that the tags on each block are being deleted as soon as the trigger zone detects something. So how do we emit things in different directions? Well, we can take this chip and multiply it or duplicate it a few times. But first, I'd like to move the microchip into a better position so we can see. And I'm going to move it four away from the center there. The tag stayed in place and the trigger zone stayed in place, so we don't have to worry about moving those. And all I'm going to do here is I'm going to duplicate this chip and rotate it 90 degrees. I'll bring it four in back to the center and up four. Then I can press right on the D-pad two more times to duplicate it. And now we have tags in all four directions and trigger zones in all four directions. And so now I can copy this object and use this as our emission object. And now we can see what happens when we start time. I'll set it slower again just so we can watch it. 
it will teleport to one of the tags, then emit a block, and you can see both of these tags deleted themselves because they're seeing each other. The block then teleported to another tag and emitted something, and it'll continue doing that as long as there is a tag. You can see if I speed up time, it's pretty quick and generates um, sort of in a circular direction, although there's nothing enforcing that, so at some point it may start acting a little different. I saw this technique in a recent ACERT video on his procedurally generated dungeon, and I thought it was a pretty great way of doing things in dreams, especially since there's no real math involved. Um, you just have to place things correctly and things should work. Now I saw this technique in a ACERT video on his procedurally generated dungeon that he was building for his RPG game. If you haven't seen that video, I'll leave a link to it in the description below. And it's clearly a very smart way of setting things up so that you don't have to use math to determine where things are going to be generated. Now this video and technique that I'm using will employ some of those te techniques, but it won't be a, a straight ripoff or a copy. I'm going to be doing some different things here. Uh, but, like I said, if you haven't seen it, you should watch this video, it's really cool. Now instead of using this timer, because uh, we're limited to some amount of time, um, we can use something else, like a trigger zone. Now this tag needs to sense something, so we can sense the next tag, and when that's true, then we can emit something after it emits, it'll go back and teleport to the next tag. And this doesn't, we don't need to worry about the zone size, we can just set it to a scene. And that just means it will only go to this emitter if there's a tag for it to emit at. Now we don't want this trigger zone to always be on or else it will immediately go to B and it won't teleport. So I'll put a small timer here and we will use the finished to turn this on and when we go to the A it will reset the timer. So if you use a very small time like a frame or two then this trigger zone won't be on by default and it will move only when it detects a tag after it's teleported. You can see how fast this is and it's pretty fun to watch. Now, if I didn't have this timer connected to this trigger zone, what would happen is this would be on immediately, and so it will go to port B, it will emit the object, and since this never turned off, uh, it will never go back to B, because even though this is on, we're stuck at A. So what we need to do is reset this timer so the trigger zone turns off every time it goes back to the A port. Now, to make things uh, generate more evenly, if we want them to continuously go around and around, we would need to use something else to determine which next tag is on. So for this, we can use a timer, and I'll set the target time to whatever the max is, 10,000 seconds. And we'll get out an exclusive gate, and we'll use this to power the tag. Now, the reason I have a timer is so that we can set the current time to modulate with this um, priority. So at zero, the priority will be 10. And then at one second, well, as the time goes up, you can see the priority, oops, as the time goes up, you can see the priority climbing. Well, it got deleted because this tag was emitted at, but uh, you get the idea. And then we can use the, um, timer output to turn on this gate input so as long as this is not zero this will turn the tag on and so you can see that gate was on now we want this in all of them and what this is doing is essentially saying the longer this tag sits the higher the priority it will become so newer tags won't get teleported to until the older tags have already been visited and deleted copy this over to these other locations. I'll delete the old object we were emitting. 
and copy this over. Now we'll use this copy as our object. And so now if we watch time, we can see that it generates in a more you know, circular or just round pattern because when this one's emitted, this timer in here is making the priority bigger. So the longer it sits there, the higher the priority it becomes. Okay, so with that we have a nice procedural generation that goes, um, that sprawls outwards. And um, if you have seen the ACERT video, this is where uh, I stop employing his techniques and start moving on to something uh, different. Instead of building different sized rooms like he did in his uh, dungeon generation, I actually want to use the chips inside here to generate walls. The benefit of creating walls with these chips is that each floor space can set up its own walls and we only need to have one floor tile to create an elaborate uh, maze or labyrinth or whatever you want to call it. So with that being said, let's go ahead and copy. I'm just bringing the sculpt here. Notice this is not uh, the same object. It doesn't have the chips. And I'm going to use this as our wall piece, which we can generate. I'm going to move the wall inside halfway so that it slightly overlaps both this floor piece and if there were one here then this floor piece as well. I also want to change the label on the wall so that it is not scenery. This way this tag doesn't see this wall and decide to delete itself. The reason we want to do that is this trigger zone is not lined up with this wall but with this whole space here. So if there was a floor here that had a wall right here and this floor piece got set down, it would immediately delete this tag because it would have collided with the wall. So this is why I'm changing the label on the wall to be something other than scenery so that these trigger zones don't trigger these destroyers when a wall is there. So obviously with this wall in place, we're gonna need something to emit it. So I'll grab out an emitter. And again, since we're not using scene space transform, we're going to need to correctly line this object up if it isn't already. This looks good to me, so I think I'm good. I'm good there. Now, in order to determine when to power this, we need to think about a couple things. We don't want to power this if there's already a wall there, because we don't want two walls. We also probably don't want to power this every time or else we won't even be able to move out of a single room or area or whatever you want to call it. So since we have a couple different things we need to look out for, I'm going to get out an AND gate and this AND gate will power this emitter. So let's detect the wall. I'll move this gizmo just right here and we will be looking for the label of object because that's what the wall was labeled with. I can make it a square and this doesn't need to be this big so I'll just make it smaller. This looks good enough. And so we only want to emit it if we don't have a wall there. So if this is not detecting something then we can emit a wall. And for now let's also say we don't want to emit when there is a floor piece already next to it. This way it doesn't block off other things. Once this object has been emitted, we can also plug that into this into the destroyer to destroy the chip. Now this isn't done yet because as of right now what would happen is the second time starts, both of these trigger zones won't detect something, it'll emit a wall and then destroy itself, meaning that all four of these would just immediately emit a wall and nothing else would happen. So just for now, I'm going to get a randomizer out and I'll set it to true random. And I'll plug this A port into this C port. So this way it will only emit a wall if the randomizer happens to land on A. And that will produce some variability in how many walls we have. I just realized one thing we need to fix is because I added this wall, it's throwing off the grid size of um, 
for the grid orientation which threw off our emitter position as you can see here. So the reason this is is because I forgot to take this wall out of the group. We don't want this wall to be part of this object otherwise it will affect its uh, position in the emission. So with that we can take it out and I can turn preview invisibility back on. So now we can see if I pause and or play time and restart time it randomly spawns walls in its four cardinal directions. And of course if I turn on the x-ray mode we can see those chips being deleted every time there's a wall emitted and when there's not a wall it's not deleted. Now we can copy this object over and use this to emit. And now we can see as time plays, sometimes walls are created, sometimes they aren't. When they are, a the um, tag disappears next to the wall because that's how it should work. And so now if I start time with full speed, we can see it building a labyrinth of floors and walls and since there's no limit right now this will continue to place floors and randomly place walls which is a pretty neat technique for making a maze in a pretty quick amount of time here. Now obviously at some point we want to stop our emission or else this will keep running forever and eventually we'd run out of thermo. Uh, we're currently sitting at 10% gameplay memory and so when we decide we want to stop, what we'll need to do is place walls everywhere um, along the outside so that the entire thing is closed off. And with that, we could realistically place walls everywhere that a tag still exists. So since we want to set some sort of a limit, I'll get out a counter here. And uh, we'll just set this to, I don't know, 50 for now. And so what we'll do is every time we emit something, we'll increase the counter. Now that we have a counter, I can take the current count and place that into a number displayer so we can see how many rooms we have as we generate. And once it's done, once the counter is full, we can go ahead and destroy this entire object. Now since this chip is stamped onto this, micro this uh, cube, um, when this destroyer powers on, it will destroy this whole thing here. So if I set this to something small here, like 5 instead of 50, we can see that in real time. And there we go. There would be our finished thing. So obviously we want, before we destroy it, we want to send a signal to all of these chips telling them to put walls up. So since we want to do that, I'll get out a wireless transmitter. And I'll call this wireless transmitter end generation. Back inside of our floor chips, we need to add something like a wireless receiver that can accept transmissions from end generation. We'll set this scene wide. And actually, since this is scene wide, this is going to take up probably more memory since it has a, a type of trigger zone on it. So I'm actually going to swap these to go the other way around. Instead of putting this transmitter here, I'll put the transmitter on the chips because I believe those cost less memory. And this way we only have one wireless receiver called end generation that is seen wide. Since these are two way, you can actually send information from either one. So right now I have this switch plugged into the receiver, but we can see that the transmitter receives the signal just fine. And of course this works the other way around. If we have the switch plugged into the transmitter and we turn this switch on, we can see that it receives the data and it also gives a little visual feedback here too. Anyways, with that out of the way, we'll set this counter full into the receiver, which will send a signal to all the transmitters. And I'll go ahead and place the transmitter in this chip. And so this signal, we can plug into this same port as the randomizer because we want to ensure that it creates a wall as long as these trigger zones are not detecting anything which will then emit 
the wall and destroy the entire object or the entire chip excuse me so now I can delete those other microchips clone this one and we should be good to go I'll make sure the emitted object is the same as these ones as the one we just edited and we can also send this uh, finished or counter full into this into the destroyer so now we can watch this in slower time here just to make sure it will emit objects until we hit the counter full and once the counter is full we'll place up all the walls and destroy the object this effectively will close off whatever we're making so that the player can't fall out of the object itself and so now if we watch in real time with the max set at 50 this will go until we hit 50 rooms and then it will close off the entire thing we can see that this is a very cheap way to create a interesting type of labyrinth uh, we're not done and we're at 15 percent 16 percent gameplay memory and once everything is finished we delete all trigger zones that were attached to these and all of the microchips as well and we drop down to 12 percent gameplay memory even though we're sitting at 500 different floor pieces here in the next video i'll be showing how we can set up a ending space or a boss room for the player to try and reach to move on to the next floor if you enjoyed this and want to learn more click subscribe so you can see the rest of the series as it comes out and leave any feedback or questions you may have in the comments below I'll see you in the next video.